France has finally announced that it will withdraw its soldiers and ambassador from Niger. What led to this dramatic turnaround? After nearly five months of striking, Hollywood writers may be close to a tentative deal with major studios. Have the demands of the workers been addressed? This is the Daily Debrief. These are your stories for the day. And before you go any further, if you haven't hit the subscribe button already on YouTube, please do. Almost two months after the military coup in Niger, France has finally said that it will withdraw its troops and ambassador from the country. Now, this comes after weeks of demonstration in Niger against its former colonizer France, which has kept 1,500 soldiers in the name of fighting terrorism. The coup leaders had also taken a strong stand against the French presence. It's been a dramatic time in the Sahel region as a whole. Last week, we saw Niger join Mali and Burkina Faso to form the Alliance of Sahel States, which could be a defining moment. We go to Kambale Musawali for more on all these developments. Kambale, thank you so much for joining us. A uh, very interesting uh, development with the French announcing that they will withdraw. It's been a battle of wills, it looks like, for the past many weeks. The government sticking to its stand very uh, closely while the French, you know, trying all their propaganda weapons, trying to say that they were being besieged, trying to say that they were held hostage, etc. Although the fact that they were, they were the, uh, their, their soldiers were in a foreign country, so avoiding that. But what do you think forced France to finally uh, capitulate at this point of time? It's very fascinating time to be on the African continent. It wasn't really a matter of if they will live, it's really when they will live. Um, in Niger, and of course in many of the Francophone countries in, in um, West Africa, the presence of the French military, uh, the presence of French multinationals is, has not been welcome, right? And uh, the people of the region have, for over a decade, been, they have been saying, France dégage. France must go. France must leave. And he has expressed itself uh, in the past few months or a couple of years in the multiple coup d'etats taking place in the Sahel, where you hear very clearly from the coup leaders saying, we want to break from the connection, from the, uh, I could call it really, I mean, the clearly, it's a colonial yoke controlled by France where they see the currency controlled by France, they see uh, foreign military bases led by France uh, most of the time, uh, they see French multinational extracting resources um, in the region, be it oil, be it gold, be it um, also uh, uranium in the case of Niger. So hearing that statement, it simply means that the people have won what they've called for. They've called for France to leave, France did not want to leave. France was very arrogant uh, in saying that they will not actually remove the soldiers and diplomats. But uh, they have capitulated where you hear uh, Macron say that they are leaving. And they add the reason why they are leaving is because the country is no longer, uh, in the case of Niger, the country is no longer interested in fighting terrorists, which is bizarre you know, to hear that statement when you see a few days ago, uh, the countries of the region, uh, the Liptako Goma uh, area, Mali, Niger, and Burkina, signed an alliance uh, where, in that alliance, in one of the articles, it's clearly stated that they are coming together to stop the terrorists. Right. Right. Come back in context, uh, you know, we are, I think we are entering two months since the coup took place. And in the immediate aftermath, there was, you know, a considerable amount of uh, threats from ECOWAS, of course, still continuing to this day. ECOWAS backed by France, of course, to some extent, the US also maybe. But there was talk about military intervention. The chiefs of staff met. They said that D-Day had been decided, etc., etc. But in the following days, we actually seen, we actually saw a lot of that uh, initial aggression sort of, uh, you know, coming to a halt. So maybe if you look at the past two months, what really kind of led to this initial threat not really working out? This was really exposed, right? It's the people of the region have exposed ECOWAS. Uh, they have exposed ECOWAS in showing the world that they are an entity that does not reflect the aspiration of the people of the region. 
So what is the context? The people of Niger, right? Niger borders Nigeria. When you look at Niger and Nigeria, the people of Niger literally have family members across the border. So when you see the president of uh, Nigeria calling for a military uh, operation you know, to you know, find Bazuma, put him back in, in, uh, into power, and you hear the people of the region, especially the northern part of Nigeria, the, all the governors of the northern part of Nigeria clearly stated to the president that you are not going our provinces, you're not going to use our provinces to enter Niger. Right? Why? It's the same people. These borders are porous. The people of the region have celebrated, the people of Niger have celebrated the end of Bazoum. And their neighbor country wants to have a military presence to bring him back, which is not what the people want. Right? So that's, that's really what happened, that the people have won what they wanted. And unfortunately, uh, ECOWAS, no CDL in French, were, are not in tune with what's happening with the people. But the second thing also, to people need to understand why the people of Niger support the junta. When you just look at the past administration, and I mean, you can read the statement from the coup leaders about why they did the coup, people don't even realize what Bazoum did beyond a rigged election where he sidelined all the opposition leader. Um, Isuf, the president before him, created a system to make sure that he actually won the presidency. But when he was president, only speaking about security, not even the corruption cases, do people realize that Bazoum released terrorists numerous times that were arrested? Can you imagine, I think earlier this year in 2023, about nine terrorists were released after they were caught. And this was a shocker even to the military, that the president of the country, who wants peace and security in the country, decide after we arrest the terrorists, we are going to release them. And that's when we speak uh, with comrades in, uh, in Niger, they keep reminding us this, that Bazoum is a threat to security in the country. They want peace and security, and he, he has done many things while he was president, to sabotage the army, to release terrorist cut back into the wilderness, and these terrorists come back and attack the country. So the people of Niger, they are clear. ECOWAS is not clear. ECOWAS has not engaged in bringing about peace and stability in Niger. So the people of Niger took it upon themselves to now um, no, take control of the country, remove uh, Bazou, and it's to see uh, the future of, of Niger, what will take place with the junta, how they will engage with the population, the, the rapport, the force that will exist between the people to, to hold uh, the current leader accountable. But with every indication now, uh, we see that the people are holding the leaders accountable and the leaders, of, you know, these, the junta leaders, are following the interests of the people. So I'm not surprised that Francis Capit... Uh, Ca Titulated to the will of the people, and it's only to see now what will come out of the alliance that's been built of the region to bring about peace and stability in the Sahel. Right, Kamara, that is my final question as well. The alliance of Sahel states, like you already mentioned, very interesting moment there because we have three countries uh, which are on very similar trajectories. It seems like seems like and facing very similar challenges coming together. So, what did you think were the highlights of this charter at this point of time? This alliance is a security alliance, right? Two things come up very clearly, sovereignty and security. They want to make sure that they work together to bring an end to the jihadist attacks, the terrorist attacks that's taking place uh, in the countries. And second is that they are committing to making sure that for any external intervention in any of the countries, they will help one another to protect the country. That is really coming out of uh, Kwame Nkrumah's vision, right? When he thought, thought about the United States of Africa, uh, calling for a command center, a United Command Center to protect African nations from foreign attacks. We're seeing three African countries do that. And it's innovative and it's very important. Can you imagine if from the beginning of uh, the attacks, uh, the jihadist attacks in uh, Niger, Mali, and Burkina Faso, 
this took place with ECO, ECOWAS, that the ECOWAS forces uh, were actually coming together for that. That would have been amazing. But so for me, I'm very inspiring with the alliance taking place. The implementation of it um, is going to be difficult still with the foreign military bases still present in the region. I'm worrying about the U.S. Um, military base in Niger, the drone base that's there. The data has not yet been dismantled. So we, all we can do at the moment is support the will of the people, explain the challenges that we face, and be uh, the, the voice you know, to sound the alarm of what is taking place there. But I will end by also say that even when we're talking about the jihadist, uh, the, the terrorist attack, we're talking about it in a uh, very short time, uh, time stamp in history without a context. We should know that the destabilization of Niger, the destabilization of Mali, the destabilization of Burkina Faso with the terrorist attack is in direct connection with Hillary Clinton's action and Barack Obama's action backed by NATO of toppling Gaddafi in Libya. So while we will talk about the security issue, we are completely forgetting that we have a security issue in the Sahel today because of the unilateral um, action of NATO and the United States in Libya. So while we are protecting ourselves, we should look into history to make sure that to hold uh, the U.S. Uh, Africa accountable, to hold NATO accountable for the operations which has destabilized the region. But I'm very hopeful to see these nations coming together for peace and security in the Sahel. And I'm very happy to also see that they continue to listen to the voice of the people. History may absolve them, but for now, they are following the voice of the people of the Sahel. Right. Thank you so much, Kambale, for that analysis. We'll come back to you soon as, uh, because it's definitely a rapidly developing situation. Thank you so much. The Writers Guild of America, the union representing screenwriters, has reached a tentative deal with studios. Screenwriters have been on strike since May 2nd with a series of demands including pay, staffing and the impact of artificial intelligence. However, the deal still has to be approved by the union membership and the work stoppage in Hollywood won't end exactly yet. This is because actors who are organized by the SAG after a performance union are still on strike. We go to Anish for more details. Anish, thank you so much for joining us. Of course, a bit early to talk about what might finally be the deal that will come out of this. But right now from the reports, what does it look like? What, what are the tentative terms, so to speak? Well, they're talking about, we do not have a clear idea of what they're talking about actually at the, at the current moment because uh, the final language of the contract is yet to be decided. And that is the tricky part. You know, you can agree to a whole host of things, but if the language gives uh, the bosses uh, some kind of leeway in certain very key aspects, that can actually undo a lot of uh, gains that were made. So this is something that the WGA wants to be very careful about, and it might take a little bit more time than uh, uh, than you know other kind of deals that we've seen on tentative uh, deals were released to the uh, to the membership uh, within days, not even within days, within hours after it was struck with the negotiating team. Uh, nevertheless, the bargaining team spoke about how uh, major victories uh, were and uh, protections were uh, gained, and that very clearly indicates that they have uh, secured some level of uh, protections from uh, the advent of AI and possibly, and this might be a landmark thing if it actually does happen, uh, some kind of revenue sharing agreement uh, for uh, you know streaming broadcast. And that is something that is going to be very revolutionary for uh, you know not just Hollywood but for the entire entertainment industry and that can impact the whole world it itself. So this is something that uh, the writers have, and these two were some of the key, the most central issue, apart from uh, other factors, obviously, uh, better contract, uh, staffing, uh, minimum uh, staffing for writers and stuff like that. Uh, these two were actually some of the essential demands, and that's what they were, uh, that's why the strike was needed, and this was the most tricky point. So we can uh, assume that there must have been some kind of uh, a good uh, level of protections or gains made in these uh, areas. And that is something that we need to wait and see what the final draft of the agreement would say. 
uh, if they have actually uh, got uh, or secured a deal that uh, is at par with uh, TV broadcast, then this is actually would be something that actually changes how uh, you know streaming platforms even work and function in the current scenario and how revenues are going to be shared from them. Uh, protections for AI is going to be very dicey, and that is where uh, we need to wait and see uh, what kind of uh, protections that they might have secured. Because uh, the the fear is real. It's not something that has been concocted. Uh, AI can and has. Uh, there has been potential where uh, they can actually cut down on the number of writers, uh, where studios might use AI to cut down on number of writers, uh, and you know maybe even do away with a team. That's that's been like something that some of the major studio bosses have talked about in different forums. Uh, and that is something that is going to affect not just uh, livelihoods of writers, but also like entertainment in general. And so we need to wait and see how even that is going to uh, pan out in the current scenario. Right, Anish, uh, just to go in some depth into two, two of these issues, you talked about the revenue sharing issue. Could you explain <clears throat> what the real issue behind this is? Because I think with the coming of um, uh, you know, firms like Netflix, Amazon Prime, all that, there is that shift that has taken place. So could you explain what the contention was really? Well, uh, it is kind of uh, taken for granted today, but uh, a very similar uh, issue happened when TV television actually came into, uh, the, uh, into the scene in the uh, late 50s and 60s when broadcast television was the most common medium of entertainment. And what happened was a uh, repeat broadcast of shows uh, would uh, mean that there will be extra revenue that were, uh, you know, generated and studio bosses uh, would eventually get most of it. And that is something that the writers uh, at that point in time uh, found to be very unfair to them because it was their work and their royalties were essentially taken away from them primarily because, uh, through these repeat broadcasts. And that is something that they had a very similar kind of strike, uh, which went on for months and they won that, uh, they secured that victory, they gained that revenue sharing. And that has been going on. That's the uh, same kind of deal of revenue sharing has been going on for decades now. With the advent of streaming platform, it's a very similar case, but it's just that when it came to streaming, while it is technically considered as television in most other cases, when it comes to revenue sharing, it was not considered television. Uh, or it was not considered broadcast or repeat broadcast uh, because streaming is essentially you can uh, you know pay on demand you know stream on demand and watch on demand and that created a different kind of uh, setting as well and studio bosses use that as a way to generate income uh, revenue that need not be shared with the writers or any kind of creative or even artists for that matter actors even. And that has created this uh, situation where writers were losing revenue, uh, losing wages and royalties in real terms. And that affected them because most of the shows, most major shows that we to today uh, watch and know about uh, actually uh, are big on streaming platforms and it very rarely goes to uh, television first these days. And that has created this uh, scenario where, you know, wages and royalties were essentially snatched away from them. And this is what the writers uh, have been demanding that there needs to be a new kind of revenue sharing agreement. And that pretty much uh, is a very similar demand that the SAG AFRA strike strikers have been calling for because it is it has actually affected them the worst even. And we, we can actually see some kind of, uh, uh, you know, uh, spillover of these, uh, whatever happens with this final draft. Uh, contract uh, into the sag after strike as well because it will be very similar kind of uh, it was a very similar kind of strike in the 60s that created a revenue sharing agreement for actors and writers and it is very likely that this is going to affect how uh, the actor strike will also uh, take shape and how the demands will be delivered by studio bosses. Right Anish that is really my next question that has there been any signs of breakthrough in the actor strike because Many of the demands, like you said, are quite similar. How are the studios responding? We need to wait and see because uh, we have seen that uh, talks right now have not really gone or you know progressed any further since the strike began. And uh, but uh, the kind of victory that uh, uh, that WGA is talking about 
and if it actually uh, whatever uh, shape it takes and obviously it, uh, whatever deal happens uh, will need to be ratified by the members majority of the members for it to be finalized and for the strike to get over so it will take weeks obviously so whatever uh, victory uh, happens with the writer strike will also affect how uh, actors and art, uh, you know performers performing artists will be uh, dealt with uh, it is very difficult because sag aftra is actually fighting two different strikes right now it is obviously the amtp is one uh, there is the video game strike we, which we spoke about earlier uh, which might happen in uh, you know the coming weeks and so this is, these two uh, battles are going to go hand in hand uh, there are some fundamental differences obviously ai may not be the like uh, at least in the case of t- uh, television shows AI may not be uh, affecting uh, performance artists as much as writers do, uh, but they are very concerned about revenue sharing and obviously minimum wages. Uh, one of the major things about uh, actors' strike is the fact that a large number of uh, staffing there has been obviously sh- uh, staffing shortages or you know inadequate staffing by major studios. Uh, there's also working conditions that are not very safe for many of the artists. Uh, and we need to remember that we're not talking about millionaires uh, or you know you know A-listers, but more than ninety percent of the actors who make basic minimum wages, essentially speaking, or you know at par with uh, median wages of California, uh, basically living wages, uh, and they are the ones who really need these deals to happen. And so, uh, if the revenue sharing deal happens in a in the manner in which that WGA wanted. Uh, with their strike uh, with AMTP, uh, AMTP, uh, it is going to have a similar impact and might be a model for uh, that actors and performing artists might use for their uh, demands as well. So we need to wait and see how their negotiations are going. But this is this clearly shows both uh, this entire scenario clearly shows that strikes are working. Strikes are pretty much uh, that uh, labor mobilization is working. And it is giving, uh, delivering what uh, workers want. And even in a very uh, high profile, uh, you know, very st- uh, star studded kind of industry that Hollywood is, even their strikes are working and it's making a big impact right now. Man, any strikes are working and it's unnecessary because I think one thing we learned from this is that uh, the entertainment industry is not just about the A-listers, like you said, but tens of thousands of people, writers, uh, supporting actors who actually earn very little. And while we consume a lot of uh, this entertainment media, it's important to think about all these people and their struggles as well. Thank you so much for talking to us. And that's all we have today in this episode of The Daily Debrief. Please come back tomorrow for another episode. In the meanwhile, visit our website, peoplesdispatch.org. Follow us on all the social media platforms. And if you haven't hit that subscribe button on YouTube yet, please do. 